Go to now, ye rich men, weep and howl for your miseries that shall come upon you. Your riches are corrupted and your garments are moth-eaten. Your gold and silver is cankered, and the rust of them shall be a witness against you, and shall eat your flesh as it were fire. Ye have heaped treasure together for the last days. Behold, the hire of the laborers who have reaped down your fields, which is of you kept back by fraud, crieth. And the cries of them which have reaped are entered into the ears of the Lord of Sabaoth. Ye have lived in pleasure on the earth and been wanton. Ye have nourished your hearts as in a day of slaughter. Ye have condemned and killed the just, and he doth not resist you. Be patient therefore, brethren, unto the coming of the Lord. Behold, the husbandman waiteth for the precious fruit of the earth, and hath long patience for it, until he receive the early and latter rain. Be ye also patient, establish your hearts, for the coming of the Lord draweth nigh. Grudge not one against another, brethren, lest ye be condemned. Behold, the judge standeth before the door. Take, my brethren, the prophets who have spoken in the name of the Lord for an example of suffering, affliction, and of patience. Behold, we count them happy which endure. Ye have heard of the patience of Job, and have seen the end of the Lord, that the Lord is very pitiful and of tender mercy. But above all things, my brethren, swear not, neither by heaven, neither by the earth, neither by any other oath. But let your yea be yea, and your nay nay, lest ye fall into condemnation. Is any among you afflicted, let him pray. Is any merry, let him sing songs. Is any sick among you, let him call for the elders of the church, and let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer of faith shall save the sick, and the Lord shall raise him up. And if he have committed sins, they shall be forgiven him. Confess your faults one to another, and pray one for another, that ye may be healed. The effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much, Elijah was a man subject to like passions as we are, and he prayed earnestly that it might not rain, and it rained not on the earth by the space of three years and six months. And he prayed again, and the heaven gave rain, and the earth brought forth her fruit. Brethren, if any of you do err from the truth, and one convert him, let him know that he which converteth the sinner from the error of his way shall save a soul from death, and shall hide a multitude of sins. Hello and welcome everybody to the Divine Program of the World's History book reading we are doing today, the second recording today we are doing on this 4th of July 2019. We are in a very, very interesting portion of the book. In fact, one of the portions of the book that I've been waiting for for a very long time, patiently, dealing with the time just after the, what shall we say, turn of the 18th century into the 19th century, Yerk? No, the turn off from the 19th oh, into 19th the 20th, to the 20th century. Okay, I'm yeah. sorry. Right. We are we are talking about the revival of the Roman Catholic Church in England that uh, took its beginning, of course, in the late 1830s with the Oxford movement. And then you have the time of 1870 when the Pope lost his temporal power, as we know. And because of the loss of uh, uh, of the loss of his temporal power, he strengthens his spiritual power. That's right. And what we are reading now is the coming back of the Roman Catholicism into the <clears throat> into the quote unquote traditions of the Anglican Church in the Anglican Church. And we were just reading about the roots of uh, the Charismatic movement by this um, uh, Caldwell or Caldell or what was his name? I don't remember. We are going to read that in a moment. Um, 
and as, as we read in the last part, this is actually... Oh, Campbell? The, was that it? Campbell, Campbell? yeah, Campbell. Yeah, yeah thanks. Uh, uh -huh. This Campbell guy, and um, that is actually, if you track it down, if you see what happened there with the hypnoto uh, hypnotizing and all that stuff, you understand that those are uh, spiritual exercises of Ignatius Loyola as the finest example. And um, that led the... Uh, "Quote unquote Protestant churches into uh, charismatics, and uh, charismatics are more influenced by New Age and Roman Catholicism than they would ever admit. But that's the way it is. So this is on the path to ecumenism. That was uh, then crowned, of course, in the 1960s, 1962 to 1965, with the Second Vatican Council, which was the Ecumenical Council, where." The whole movement that started in 1833 in the Oxford movement um, found its climax in more or less all church agreeing back under the wings of Rome. And uh, that culminated, of course, as you know, in the treaty the Lutheran Worldwide Federation signed in, on October 31st, 1999 with the Roman Catholic Church on the joint doctrine of justification. And, uh, you know, those things are always planned very well in advance. And we are speaking now about a century before, the turn of the century, 19th to the 20th century, the beginning of this uh, with these uh, Campbell guy. Um, yeah, the beginning of the, of the charismatic movement. Um, it's, it's quite a different subject what we are reading now than we have read before. Before we have always read about very numerous and uh, interesting historical facts uh, like like wars and overthrows and revelations and 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 uh, prophecies and all that stuff but now we are really speaking about the great apostasy of the uh, of the quote unquote true church even though the anglican church never was a true protestant church because it always had a lot of roman catholic leaven in it but it's it's very interesting to see how subtle the roman catholic church works and we know that subtleness is one of the attributes of the devil, because the serpent was more subtle than all the other animals in the garden, right? Right. So we are dealing with that subject now, and I'm very eager to return to the reading, Brett, if it's all right with you. Please, let's do it. And let's see where the author leads us to, because, you know, I haven't had time to prepare this, but we are on page 172 in the book, page 130 in the PDF. So as you can see, we still have some 38 pages to go. This uh, sentence is highlighted in green. We are going to read it directly. This is where we left up, but I'm going to start at the beginning of the little uh, paragraph where it says, The author offered to go and address the North London Presbytery and demonstrate how completely they had been deceived but was informed by one old minister who knew the temper of these men that they would surely refuse to grant him a hearing. Men always resent their idols being broken. There can be no doubt that there are large numbers of ministers who do not know what it means to really win a man to Christ. It is from this class of men that these false reports emanate. They do not know any different. Now what does it all mean? Does it mean these men are willfully deceiving? No. It simply means that they whittle down and rationalize after the style of the German school, yeah, the rationalists, the miraculous and supernatural in the scriptures, so that certain types of quote-unquote superminds can receive it. They term this, quote, helping them toward Christ, unquote. A case in point may be mentioned. Bernard Shaw, the notorious atheist and scoffer, in 1913 presided at the annual dinner of the Bradlaugh Atheist Society, and he jokingly remarked that his next engagement was at the city temple. Bernard Shaw agreed with Mr. Campbell, and Mr. Campbell agreed with Mr. Bernard Shaw. Yet Bernard Shaw told the Cambridge students in 1912 that any man who believed that Jesus Christ was the highest type of man this world had ever seen or would ever see, any man who says that was not fit to associate with. Now what fellowship could any real Christian have with such a blasphemer? 
but these wandering stars soon burned themselves out. In 1915, Mr. Campbell resigned the pastorate of the city temple on the ground of ill health. He had to flog himself to prepare for the Sunday services. He claimed and would stand it no longer. He, on the other hand, had been in France, preaching as often as three times a day to the soldiers and was going back again. A week or two later it leaked out that he was about to join the High Church of England. The Bishop of Birmingham wrote to the press that two months before Mr. Campbell had quietly withdrawn his new theology from circulation. The Bishop stated that he had made this a condition of his entry into the Church of England. Mr. Campbell, however, has never openly told this to an insulted and offended Christian world. Now the word of confession that he was wrong from 1907 through 1915. On the other hand, the Daily Chronicle reported Mr. Campbell to have said there was no change in his theological views. There must have been a tremendous change to honestly get into the Church of England, for the High Church sails under her colors and uses her creed. To get in honestly, he had to accept the very truths he so scornfully repudiated in his new theology, meaning the virgin birth of Christ, his deity, atonement, resurrection, ascension, and of course the final judgment, heaven and hell. Why deceive ourselves any further concerning this man? If the scriptures mean anything, they mean that this man is simply the devil disguised as an angel of light, or professed light-giver. He is everything that is lovely and charming to look upon, just as an angel or uh, just as an angel of light would outwardly appear, but an emissary of Satan for all that. Now, since he has joined the High Church of England, he always has a so ha, ha, sorry, he always has a word to say for Romanism in nearly every sermon. If he speaks of a Protestant minister performing a noble deed at the front, he always has one or two priests following who equal or go one better. Rome clearly sees which way he is heading. Here's what she says. From the Birmingham Catholic magazine for December 1915 has this paragraph on Campbell. Quote, the Reverend R. J. Campbell, late of the City Temple London, who is announced to be coming to Birmingham as an Anglican, writes from the front in an article to the Illustrated Sunday Herald. Since the war began, I have realized in French churches, as I never did before, the devotional value, the practical helpfulness of the reservation of the sacrament of the altar. It makes all the difference between a dead building and a place that is sanctuary indeed. Mr. Campbell in times past manfully defended the priests of Spain from an attack by British critics, and who knows but what Birmingham may be but a temporary sojourn on the way to Rome. What I find the most important part of this little sentence that I just read is the practical helpfulness of the reservation of the sacrament of the altar. Jesus Christ did the sacraments for us. He did the sacrifice, sorry. He did the one and only sacrifice that counts for all of us, once and for all. There is no sacrament of the altar. First and for all, these altars and churches are built by stones made by hand like the Tower of Babel, when they said, let us make bricks. Yeah? They refused to use the natural stone that God gives. Whenever you read in the Bible that Abraham, Jacob, or whoever builds an altar for God, or Joshua later, or Moses, when they built an altar to God, they always used the stone as they were found on the ground. God thinks that stones who by hand are an abomination to build an altar for him too. That's what the Roman Catholic Church does. And she uses even this altar to perform a sacrament, the sacrament of the Mass, the transubstantiation of bread and wine into the body, the soul, the divinity and humanity, and the flesh and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ himself, and 
This is what they speak about here. The reservation of the sacrament of the altar. Making Jesus Christ this little waver of bread and sacrificing him over and over and over again. This is what this little sentence actually talks about. And this is the problem with many people reading the sentence, just reading over it, don't even understanding how profound and deep going this little sentence actually is. And that's why I like to discuss it with you and like to propose to you that how, when you read this book, you have to understand what is written here. Yeah? This is very, very Catholic and absolutely anti-biblical. Now, the author continues to say, nearly all of our great theologians who have from the first recognized Mr. Campbell's true character now expect him to eventually land in the Church of Rome. If there are two men in the Christian Church who during the years 1907 through 1915 AD have stood out above all others and uncompromisingly refused to bow the knee to the wisdom, philosophy, and false theology of this 20th century wandering star, they are the editor of the British Weekly and Principal Foresight of Hackney College. Thank God for such men. Some ministers do recognize the devil when they see him and are not afraid to address him as such. Only once did Dr. Forsyth slip when at the Nottingham Conference in 1911 he allowed Mr. Campbell's cunningly framed phrases to override his better judgment and inward convictions. Dr. Forsyth accepted the statement in their ordinary meaning. Mr. Campbell, as we all now see, meant something else. But what are we to think of all the thousands of ministers who sat in the, at the, on the fence and thought this crowds meant uh, and, and, and thought his crowds meant divine blessing? No class of men have done so much for the world. No class of men have done so much to mould the characters of men and nations all through the ages as the Christian ministry. Yet. No class of men exercise less common sense than they when dealing with unfaithful members of their own calling. If a man is only a university graduate, he can palm off any false philosophy on them. If the Navy and Board of Trade granted certificates to captains who knew as little about navigation and seamanship as half the Christian ministry know about the Bible and the way to heaven, Half the ships on the sea would be sunk or ashore on their first voyage. These are strong words, but they are the words of a man who loves the ministry and especially the old ministers who know the Lord and have lived in communion with him. The old ministers who pray and study long in private and in public pray and preach, and, and preach briefly. No men are more up to date than such men. They understand men and women and the spirit of the age. If Jesus Christ teaches anything plainly in Matthew chapter 7 verses 22 and 23, it is that many ministers of the gospel will be shut out of heaven at the great day because Jesus Christ never knew them. Let's have a look. Matthew chapter 7 verses 22 and 23. Very famous sentence that Jesus Christ says here. Many will say to me in that day, meaning when I return to the earth, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name? And in thy name have cast out devils? And in thy name done many wonderful works? And then I will profess unto them, I never knew you. Depart from me, ye that work iniquity. And the people that we were just speaking about in the book by Albert Close are a prime example of what Jesus Christ teaches right here. Mm. Now to sum up, let us see how the ministry have behaved in the face of, his, of this modern apostasy. 
In 1913, the Wesleyan Conference at Plymouth, by an overwhelming vote, approved of the appointment of the Reverend Geo Jackson for a chair in the Wesleyan Training College. In his published writings, he is at one with new theology on many vital points. It was enough to make Wesley turn in his grave. In November 1913, the Presbytery of, Lon of North London by a standing vote, expressed their approval of Dr. Orchard's teaching, although he openly associated himself with Mr. Campbell. In 1914, the Congressional Union proposed, and by the narrowest majority escaped electing Reverend R. J. Campbell as President of the Union. These great bodies foolishly fixed their eyes on the beautiful truths with which these men mixed their poison and forgot that it is the poison which, kill, which kills even when mixed. In the face of public acts like the above, is it at all surprising that the masses have so little confidence in the ministry? Above all, what must the Lord Jesus Christ think of such trifling, a trifling with divine truth? Hath God, hath God no controversy with a ministry which trifles with divine truth as these men have? Mr. Campbell is perhaps the most striking type of this generation of what Jude, verse 13, terms a wandering star. What's a wandering star? A wandering star is a star which has broken from its orbit and sphere and goes off on its own tearing through space, flaming and blazing, owing to its friction with the atmosphere through, it, uh, through which it rushes with lightning speed. For the moment it far outshines all other normal stars in the firmament. But the flash is only momentary. As suddenly as it blazes forth, just as suddenly does it, appear, does it disappear into the darkness of space. But the old normal stars still shine on, long after the passing meteor has been forgotten. How Mr. Campbell blazed and flamed in 1907, as he broke from the teaching of the scriptures and sent forth his new theology, imagining like Servetus, yeah, you know, the guy who uh, was uh, challenging Calvin, that he had received a divine commission to restore Christianity to its original purity and remodel all religious knowledge. He claimed this in his new theology on page 9. By the end of 1915, the whole movement and all Mr. Campbell's predictions had collapsed so completely that, as already stated, he abandoned the sinking wreck and climbed into the rickety high church lifeboat in the hope of reaching port by means of Romish counterfeit atonements, sacraments, rites, incense and ceremonies. If there is one characteristic of Mr. Campbell's writings which stands out above all others, it is the cunningly framed phraseology. His statements are so cunningly framed, and cunning is a description of the word Jesuit when you look up the 1828 Webster's Dictionary, let me remind you here. Yeah? If there is one characteristic of Mr. Campbell's writings which stands out above all others, it is the cunningly framed phraseology. His statements are so cunningly framed that they can be made to take on any interpretation he pleases under varying circumstances. It was by such a misuse of the English language at Nottingham in 1911 that he was able to carry an audience of educated ministers away into the belief that his doctrines were sound after all. It was only a different way of looking at things. Today we call this sophistry and casistry. Mm -hmm. Dr. Forsyth, in reviewing Mr. Campbell's career in a letter to the British Weekly on January 6, 1916, wrote, quote, it will be far better and nobler to spend neither time nor temper on criticism of Mr. Campbell's step. That were but too easy. What is not so easy, and is therefore more to edification, is to turn upon ourselves and hold inquisition here. Our avidity 
For religious impressionism, at, at the cost of faith, spiritual realism is humiliating. This is far from the only case which suggests that we ought to regain enough self-respect to be less easily exploited, less ready and effusive in receiving or accrediting people with obvious popular gifts without inquiring how they stand on the matter for which we exist, and without demanding a period of postulancy sufficient to show that we respect the mainstay, if indeed we respect it still, if we do more than court the popular or the impressive speaker. We can hardly be surprised if our ministry as an office is taken outside at our own valuation of it. We are proud that it is free, but we are ruined if we make it easy, whether at the lower end or the upper. Unquote. The professors who license these preachers are the men who should be censored. Men are frequently ordained who do not believe the doctrines they solemnly vow to teach. They bodily say so to laymen when questioned. They do not know Jesus Christ by revelation. Yet many of these men carry such degrees as Master, BD, DD, PhD, LLD, etc., 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 after the names. What does it say in the Bible? Ever learning and never come to the knowledge of the truth, eh? Yeah, that's right, you're gathering title after title, huh? academic title after title, but never gaining any smartness or wisdom of the Word of God. But some may ask why these men appeal to large numbers of men and women of the keenest intellects and highest education. <laughs> the reply is that their message is half-truth, beautifully expressed by a powerful, magnetic personality which possesses and exercises that subtle and wonderful power over the, months, uh, over the minds of others, which unconsciously compels them to see things through the preacher's eyes. Now, let us reflect on this sentence here a little bit. Because, you know, I haven't read it, I don't know what the author is going to say next. Now we are speaking here of examples of people in the church, okay? I like to take this out of the church and put this into the carnal world. And in this carnal world is that what he expresses, what the author expresses here, is that of course you can see that in the world we, we, we know as the political world we are dealing with every day. When you turn on your television and on the Fox Channel or CNN or CSNBC or I don't know, whatever channels you got over there in the United States, you see a news reporter uh, telling you something that you haven't heard before that is called news, by the way. And this news mostly comes from the mouth of people who have studied and who have an MA, a, B, a BD, a DD, a PhD, LLD, etc., 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 ever learning, never coming to the knowledge of the truth, but they are very well educated in sophistry and casuistry, and they can tell you that the sun is shining even though it is pouring rain outside. The point is, they are your leaders. And this is how he explains it here. The reply is that their message is half-truth, so they mix the truth with the lie. They mix the holy with the profane. But it is so beautifully expressed by a powerful magnetic personality, that's what these people have. In the church, look at the personality people like Kenneth Copeland have, people like Joel Olstein have, people like Hagen has. They have a personality that is so, I'm looking for the right words here, it drags you in, you know. These people stand there and they have such a quote-unquote personality that people are just dragged into the charismatic leadership of these persons. And that's also what politicians have, when we go back to the quote-unquote quote -unquote carnal world, they have such a powerful, magnific, 
uh, magnetic personality and magnif magnificent personality which possesses and exercises that subtle and wonderful power of splitting the words in sophistry and casuistry over the minds of others which unconsciously compels them to see things through the preacher's eyes. So, you are so indoctrinated with these people that are placed in the front of you when you watch television or you go to the church, to your pulpits, that the way they speak, I mean, they sell you the biggest horse crap as the sweetest honey. Mm -hmm. That's what they do. And they succeed in that because they have powerful magnetic personalities and they mix the truth with the lie. And you are dragged into these, you want to follow these people and you start seeing the things they tell you through their eyes, their own eyes. Their meaning, their teaching becomes your opinion becomes your quote-unquote knowledge, becomes what you are going to teach others. So you saw television news, or you went to the church and you heard some of these preachers, and you go home and you tell what these preachers told to your wife, to your children, to your friends, to your working colleagues, and this is how this bullshit spreads all over the world. It is how it did that in the beginning of the 20th century, which we are reading about here, and it still works in the 21st century. It is the cunning way of Gnosticism. Their message is half truth, but even though it is only half true, it is very beautifully expressed by a powerful and magnetic personality. Means Magnetic means that you are attracted to that person. You are drawn mm. to that person. You want to be like that person. Like Satan said, I want to be like the Most High. Comment. Oh, please. You know, this makes me think of... There is a, uh, uh, a channel here in the United States called uh, Public Television. And uh, it's very popular. Uh, they have all kinds of programming. I think in the BBC, they or in Europe, it's the BBC, right? In the UK, they have the BBC. It's the equivalent of public television here. And, yeah, state, uh, yeah, sorry, um, interrupt you here. State television, we call that, you know. In, ah, state television. In Germany, in Germany we have uh -huh. the ARD, that is the first German program, uh, and the ZDF, the second. Those are the television programs that uh, actually come from the state. Uh, you have the same over here in Belgium. Of course, you have that in the Flan Flemish region where I live. You have that in the French-speaking region. You have that in Netherlands. There it is the ROB, one, two, three. And in, in England, as you say properly, it is the BBC. That is the, uh, the, the, the television that first was there. The first television stations were the stations that came from the government itself. Mm -hmm. And this is... Uh, yeah, you call it public TV, we should rather call it state television because it is from the state. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. um, it is, of course, uh, full with Roman Catholics and the board of directors is only full of Roman Catholics. You even don't get in there if you're not a Roman Catholic. But that's what you call public television, what I call state television. And since the, in, in Germany at least, I think it started in 1989, the first private channel was up. Before there was no private television in Germany. Like what you have over there in America with Fox, for example, which is a uh, privately owned television station, right? The mm -hmm. other ones are owned by the state. Before 1989 in Germany, was, there was no privately owned television. That was RTL, the first one who came up. And here in Belgium, it was in the beginning of the 90s, VTM, and so on and so on. We have only always had state television over here in Europe. You in America are much um, more indoctrinated by the quote-unquote private um, television channels 
than we because you have very little public television as Brett calls it and very many private uh, television and, and we have uh, well the other way around let's say yeah. yeah yeah you know and that's the thing when you fall into this pit let's just say of watching these programmings these uh, these agendas uh, are actually what they are their agendas to uh, you know promote this Gnosticism I call it hypnosis you know it's it's really beautiful it's gorgeous and and they use wonderful music and they have the most um, eloquent voices speaking about their science and it's all about science and it's not the science of the Bible by the way no 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 Nothing to do with that, unless they are speaking of the new theology, which they do. But anyway, um, I just wanted to point that out that, uh, yeah, very sophisticated approaches to looking at information, Yerk. Mm -hmm. It's a very interesting point that you bring up this public TV or state television. Yeah, yeah, there was a researcher that called it uh, the uh, Propaganda uh, Broadcasting Service or something. How did, how did he say that? Yeah. yeah. Uh, PBS? It is state-sponsored. State huh? So. Oh, absolutely, yeah. It is the government that founds these channels, and it's the government that um, uh, says what is to be watched on these channels. And oh, and it's news. all funded by the large corporations, yeah, obviously. And over mm -hmm. here in Europe, we were obliged to pay a monthly fee just to receive that television. In Germany, it is called the GEZ, mm -hmm. G -E -Z. Yeah, that is the, um, uh, the office um, that gets that money from you, and you have to pay about, what is it, 20 euros a month? Uh, just to use television service. And you even have to pay it when you don't use it. You also have to do that for radio and all that stuff. We didn't even have private radio stations until the uh, end of the, uh, of the 1980s in Germany, or the middle of the 1980s. I remember the first uh, private radio uh, channel that I listened to was RSH, Radio Schleswig-Holstein, which is Schleswig-Holstein is the... Uh, the, the the country most northern in Germany, above Hamburg, uh, on the, uh, up to the border of Denmark. And um, they had a radio channel that was called Radio Schleswig-Holstein. Schleswig-Holstein is the name of the country, Radio is radio. So, and that was the first private channel uh, of, of radio that I listened to. All the others were ra state radios, stately radios. And uh, since then, of course, they grew like... Uh, uh, how do you say that? <laughs> they grow like mushrooms. Yeah, really, mm, sure. very, very popular. And uh, today you cannot tell whether this is a state radio or a private uh, radio, in a commercial station, you could also call it, commercial television. Oh, by yeah. the way, uh, mushrooms grow in the dark, don't they? Yeah, of course. And they feed off dead matter. Yeah. Yep, that's right. that's right. They're not really running on the light <laughs> at all. No photosynthesis. No. It's an entirely different process. So, yeah, that's a really interesting way to describe this, Yerk. And I think that mushrooms aren't even kosher to eat. Mm -hmm. But uh, they are very tasty, I have to say. <laughs> well, they can provide some health benefits depending on mm. how you eat them, right? Uh, I, love, I, I love mushrooms. Um, oh, yeah. I mean, you know, they, they're... They're good food, provided they're the correct mushroom. Yeah. No. So there's a lot of poisonous mushrooms that can kill you. That's right. And there's a lot of poisonous... Doctrine. Um, yeah, poisonous doctrine and uh, poisonous media also, especially television Well, that's radio. the thing. When we're talking about being indoctrinated, it all stems from false teaching, yeah. which the book is going to get right into. We're jumping ahead. Okay. Well, that's all right. Let's uh, just continue the reading. But I just think this sentence here that I made green mm -hmm. is, is very profound in it the is. understanding of what we are busy with here. So I like to repeat it again before we continue reading in the book. 
But some may ask why these men appeal to large numbers and men of women of the keenest intellects and the highest education. Well, that's the point. You can be so highly educated and you can have such a fine and keen intellect, but still you are dragged into by their powerful magnetic personalities, mixing the truth with the lie because it's beautifully expressed. That is what the reply is, that their message is half-truth, beautifully expressed by a powerful magnetic personality which possesses and exercises that subtle and wonderful power over the minds of others which unconsciously compels them to see things through the preacher's or teacher's eyes. False prophets who have large followings of disciples neatly sorry, nearly all possess that subtle and wonderful power in the pulpit that Napoleon exercised over men on the field of battle. It cannot be defined in words. It soothes and grips the mind and the emotions, and the victims mistake it for, the spiritual, for spiritual power from on high. These men preach their half-truth so charmingly that most of their hearers think that the half which is true is a faithful representation of the whole. No preacher can be judged by one sermon, or even by twenty, as in all he might only preach the half of his doctrines, which are true, and never touch on the false doctrines he believes and teaches at other times. Even though that I'm going to make a lot of enemies when I say this right now, I have to say it. What we just read in this little sentence is a perfect, absolutely perfect example of Seventh-day Adventist teachers like Walter Feit. And if you don't believe me, we can do another session where I contacted Presence of God Ministry, Nicholas, you remember him from this wonderful website, and he is an SDR, mm -hmm. means he left the Seventh-day Adventist church, but he still is a Seventh-day Adventist, not just not as in that church. And he put out a video a few days ago, and in the video someone else um, asked the question if Nicholas could point out the wrong teaching of Walter Feit. And I answered that guy and I said, oh, I would like to have that information too, because Nicholas said, well, just contact me via my website. So I contact, contacted Nick via his website, And this is the response that I got. Here, let's see if my original message is here. Uh, here, hi brother, I was just watching your latest video. Seventh-day Adventist leaders claim power to change Christian doctrine. And in the comment section, you propose to scriptures in your face, that's the name of the uh, uh, channel that uh, gave the comment, to share some facts on Walter Feit and his false teaching. Since I read that, I am very much interested in receiving that information too, and I kindly ask you to provide it to me, God willing. My YouTube name is Jogler66. We have changed comments in the past, so just you know who you are dealing with. And I put there my channel in there that he knows who he's dealing with. And even though it states on the website that it can take up to little but three weeks before he answers, within two days or so, I had the response from Nicholas, and this is what he wrote to me. And I'm not going to read this right now, but I'm telling you that the most um, that most of the people who are studying prophecy and uh, even the Bible online very much rely on people like Walter Feit for his teaching that comes out of the Seventh-day Adventist Church. And Walter Feit is one profound example of a person who mixes the holy with the profane. And I have always said that because I love the teaching from Walter Feit in three videos that he did. That is the first one called The Battle of the Bibles. And the second one is Changing the Worlds Part 1. And the third one is Changing the Worlds Part 2. Where he exposes all the phony Bibles that have been produced since 1870 with the wrong um, Westcott and Hort text with the Alexandrian uh, <coughs> A basis text, Codex Sinaiticus, Codex Vaticanus, and Codex Alexandrinos. 
and he is a staunch advocate of the King James Bible in those three videos and explains to the core where the deception in all the other Bibles lies. And then, in later videos, he uses quotes from the NIV, from the RSV, from the NASB, from all kind of wicked Bibles after he made these three documentaries of a running time of, I think, altogether almost four hours' time. To me, that is, how do you say that, pretentious. Mm -hmm. That is, um, I don't get the word right now, hypocrite. Well, yeah, you're not, you're not practicing what you preach. Exactly. That's hypocritical. And that's what yes. Walter Feit did. And not only yeah. Walter Feit, but also many other teachers of the quote-unquote Seventh-day Adventist Church who have a dogma that you probably most of the time don't even know. But this is what the author speaks here about. No preacher can be judged by one sermon or even by twenty, as an all he might only preach half of his doctrines which are true, and never touch on the false doctrines he believes and teaches at other times. And what are the false doctrines that they believe and teach on other times? The Seventh-day Adventist? First and for all, that Ellen G. White was a prophetess. And second of all, with their explanation of Daniel, chapter 8, verse 14, where it speaks of the prophecy of 2,300 days, and they link that to a quote-unquote investigative judgment that takes part in heaven, which no man here on earth can um, uh, can prove. All prophecies of the Bible have been fulfilled here on earth, and that prophecy is going to be fulfilled, uh, fulfilled in, in heaven when they so said, call, uh, say that Jesus Christ went from the holy place into the most holy place and is now holding his um, investigative judgment there, and nobody can prove that because we cannot look into heaven. We cannot see what God is doing there. That's false teaching, and that's only one of them. There are so many others, mm -hmm. so many other false teachings they do. And this is what the author here speaks about. Not only, of course, of the Seventh-day Adventist Church, but uh, listen, the same goes for the Lutheran Church, and Brett can tell you about that. The same goes for the Presbyterian Church. The same goes for the Baptist Church. The same goes for the Methodist Church. The same goes for all these quote-unquote protestant churches where they mix the holy with the profane yeah it is not only the seventh day adventists but the seventh day adventists are so big and people think they are so secure in that big church they never understand that the majority is always wrong So you can no preacher judge by any one sermon, nor by twenty. You have to look at his overall teaching altogether, and you will see that he mixes the holy with the profane. It was in this manner, the author continues, that the Reverend Dr. W. E. Orchard charmed the sixty ministers of North Or uh, of uh, sorry of the North London Presbytery in November 1913, when they gave him a standing vote of confidence. Now he's a leader amongst the half-truth pacifists. His modern thought messages are all half-truths. These men are, as a rule, very cunning and seldom show themselves until they are well established in the church. They may be likened to some charming people who get married. Before their marriage, they are all that is charming, meek, gentle, chivalrous, and all that is good. <laughs> After their marriage, they let the mask fall. They show another side of their nature, which proves to be their real character. Selfish, quarrelsome, and not infrequently the very opposite to what they seem to be before marriage. And let me appeal to one or another man listening to this out of the world. 
don't you see that many women are exactly that way? They sell themselves until you marry them, and after that they make you, they break you, and they break the family that you want to build, and up comes their real character. Selfish, quarrelsome, and very opposite to what they seem to be before marriage. Listen, I am a burned child. I speak of experience because that exactly happened to me when I married my wife. And I know that I am not a lone case. Okay? <laughs> so there are many others who will have the same experience. So it is with these false prophet preachers. It takes time to find out their real position. It takes time and careful attention to their words to discover the doctrines of devils they so skillfully clothe in charming phraseology. But new theology preachers are not the only sinners in this respect. One of the artifices of the present-day high church missioners is to use Sankey's hymns as a bait. They sing these beautiful hymns and for the first five or six nights preach beautiful gospel sermons that no one could take exception to. Then, about the end of the week, they introduce confession and absolution and other Romish doctrines. They did this at Lowestoft and in the Isle of Wight, to the author's certain knowledge, in December 1913. I like to take the time to tell you of another example that I can mention here from another book. And as long as I'm getting here a look at it, maybe Brett can say something to what I just read and I have a little time to look the book and the place in the book up if you have something to say right now, Brett, in the regard to what we are speaking about here. Yes, uh, I was just working on the thumbnail to this video that I just put up. Um, on my channel as we're speaking and my mind is a little fragmented at the moment but uh, I will try and regain our reading here I think we were on uh, page 178 Yerk and we are talking about um, no preacher can be judged by one sermon or even by 20 as in all he might only preach the half of his doctrines, which are true. I have it. Ah, good. Great. I have ah, it. Ah, yes. This is something that I want to tell you. Because the author speaks here of a case, and I'm going to repeat this again. And thank you, Brett, for taking over there for a second, but sure, I found sure. it quite, quite quickly. Please. Great. Um, he says, but new theology preachers are not the only sinners in this respect. Now, listen carefully what I tell you. And then see how that mirrors in what I'm going to read you next. They sing these beautiful hymns and for the first five or six nights preach beautiful gospel sermons that no one could take exception to. Then, about the end of the week, they introduce confessions and absolution and other Romish doctrines. The point is, even a Roman Catholic priest teaches something that is true. And by that what he teaches is true or preaches is true, you think he is trustable. And that's how they get you. Mm -hmm. Now what I'm going to read to you is from chapter 18 of the book Babylon Mystery Religion from Ralph Woodrow from 1966. It is a Roman Catholic miracle. It is a wonderful um, poem that I'm going to read to you. But there will be a place or two where I make a little break and explain to you why I read this now in regard to what we just read. A pretty maid, a, protest, a protestant, was to a Catholic wed. To love all Bible truth and tales, quite early she'd been bred. It sorely grieved her husband's heart that she would not comply and join the mother church of Rome and heretics deny. So day by day he flattered her, but still she saw no good would ever come from bowing down to idols made of wood. The mass, the host, the miracles were made but to deceive, 
and transubstantiation, too. <laughs> She'd never dare believe. He went to see his clergyman and told him his sad tale. My wife's an unbeliever, sir. You can perhaps prevail. For all your Romish miracles, my wife has strong aversion. To really work a miracle may lead her to conversion. The priest went with the gentleman. He thought to gain a prize. He said, I will convert her, sir, and open both her eyes. So, when they came into the house, the husband loudly cried, The priest has come to dine with us. He's welcome, she replied. And when at last the meal was over, and the priest at once began to teach his hostess all about the sinful state of man. The greatness of our Saviour's love, which Christians can deny, to give himself a sacrifice and for our sins to die. It is this little sentence that brought me to the idea to read this in regard to what we've just read in the divine program of the world's history. It says... They sing these beautiful hymns and for the first five or six nights preach beautiful gospel sermons that no one could take exception to. You see, this is what the Roman Catholic priest does. He is invited into the house and when the meal was over, the priest at once began to teach his hostess all about the sinful state of man. The greatness of our Savior's love, which Christians can deny to give himself a sacrifice and for our sins to die. This is exactly preach the beautiful gospel sermons that no one could take exception to. So you invite this Roman Catholic priest into your house and he tells you wonderful stories about the true living Jesus Christ. And you can't deny what he says because it's biblical what he says. It's true what he says. Now, You are in his realm. Now mm -hmm. he draws you into his power. Yeah, like the Black Widow spider. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Consumes well, her own uh, husband, husband, so to speak. Yeah, there we are again with the thing that I just meant about being married, yeah. you know? Okay. Yeah, we used to joke around, uh, you know, I work with different carpenters, and there was one carpenter I was working with, he would always joke around, oh, the Black Widow, <laughs> you know, you talk about, yeah, whatever, but yeah, you get the gist of it, right? Absolutely, yeah, and I hope that our listeners understand the point that I am making here, from reading this one sentence in the Divine Program of the World's History, how I come to this little poem in Ralph Woodrow's book, Babylon Mystery Religion. I think I made my point quite clear, okay? But as long as we're in it, let's just say we are going to continue this little poem to the end, of course. So after he got the attention and he got the confidence of the woman, he said, I will return tomorrow, less prepare some bread and wine. The sacramental miracle will stop your soul's decline. I'll break the bread, the lady said. You may, he did reply. And when you've seen this miracle, convinced you'll be, say I. The priest did accordingly, the bread and wine did bless. The lady asked, Sir, is it changed? The priest answered, Yes. It's changed from common bread and wine to truly flesh and blood. Begor, alas, this power of mine has changed it into God. So having blessed the bread and wine to eat, they did prepare. The lady said unto the priest, I warn you to take care. For half an ounce of arsenic was mixed right in the batter. <laughs> But since you have its nature changed, it cannot really matter. The priest was stuck real dumb. He looked as pale as death. The bread and wine fell from his hands, and he did gasp for breath. Bring me my horse, the priest cried. This is a curse at home. The lady replied, Be gone. Tis you who shares the curse of Rome. The husband, too, he said surprised, and not a word did say. 
At length he spoke. My dear, he said, the priest has run away. To gulp such mummery and tribe, I'm not for sure quite able. I'll go with you, and we'll renounce this Roman Catholic fable. And I think this is another fine moment to stop our reading, which was the second for today on the 4th of July. And understand me right, please. I am not against Roman Catholics, but I am against the hierarchy of the Roman Catholic Church. I am against the dogmas of the Roman Catholic Church. I am against the wrong teaching of the Roman Catholic Church and Seventh-day Adventist Church, and Lutheran Church, and Methodist Church, and Baptist Church, and Presbyterian Church, and whatever Church. I point them out where they leave the Bible, because that's the only book we should rely on. When Mikhail Gorbachev introduced his wife Raisa to Antichrist John Pope, uh, Pope John Paul II, he said to Raisa, Raisa, see here the highest moral authority of this world. Well, the highest moral authority in this world to me as a Bible-believing Christian is the Word of God that is to be found in the 1611 authorized version of the King James Bible, which is the only truth that I adhere to and which is the only truth that, truth that I clamp onto. I have been deceived for many, many years of my life, as has been bred, as probably have been you. And only the Bible gives me the truth, and Jesus Christ said that this truth will make me free, and it made me free, and it makes me free still every day. And therefore I need to read in it, and I need to study it, and I need to measure everything in this world against it. Because the Bible, the Word of God, is my foundation of my moral authority. That is as far as I go. And I know that is as far as bread goes. And I just ask you, is that as far as you go? Until next time, read your Bible. Maranatha. Thank you, Yerk. Again, great to make a lot of progress here. Uh, I think we've made more progress today than we've made in a good period of time, mainly because the characteristics of this particular group of topics is uh, it's, it's, it's quite a shift. It's a shift into the spiritual power that we're living in today. Mm-hmm. And this spiritual power is a special kind of spiritual power because all of a sudden we have multiple versions of what is referred to as the Word of God. What blasphemy we're living with today. And you simply cannot tell someone and have them take you serious that we've been deceived. Because they have to see it throughout the development of this new theology. See, that's what's so important about this book in this reading that we're doing right now, the discussion that we're doing, is we're showing you how in the Roman world that we're living in, because we're still in the Roman Empire, still, in 2019, how that cannot be defeated until Christ returns. We cannot be the ones that will drag anyone out of Romanism, per se. It's Christ that drags us out of Romanism. And it's to his glory, and I think Yerk and I both agree on this fact, that we do these readings and discussions for his glory and not for our own. Oh, and on that note... God. Yeah. yeah, that's right. It's all for him. And uh, till next time, God bless. We'll catch you then. Bye-bye. From whence come wars and fightings among you? Come they not hence even of your lusts that war in your members? Ye lust and have not, ye kill and desire to have and cannot obtain. Ye fight and war, yet ye have not because ye ask not. 
Ye ask and receive not because ye ask amiss, that ye may consume it upon your lusts. Ye adulterers and adulteresses, know ye not that the friendship of the world is enmity with God? Whosoever therefore will be a friend of the world is the enemy of God. Do ye think that the scripture saith in vain, The spirit that dwelleth in us lusteth to envy? But he giveth more grace. Wherefore he saith, God resisteth the proud, but giveth grace unto the humble. Submit yourselves therefore to God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Draw nigh to God, and he will draw nigh to you. Cleanse your hands, ye sinners, and purify your hearts, ye double-minded. Be afflicted, and mourn, and weep, that your laughter be turned to mourning, and your joy to heaviness. Humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord, and he shall lift you up. Speak not evil one of another, brethren. He that speaketh evil of his brother, and judgeth his brother, speaketh evil of the law, and judgeth the law. But if thou judge the law, thou art not a doer of the law, but a judge. There is one lawgiver who is able to save and to destroy. Who art thou that judgest another? Go to now, ye that say today or tomorrow, We will go into such a city, and continue there a year, and buy, and sell, and get gain. For as ye know not what shall be on the morrow, for what is your life? It is even a vapor that appeareth for a little time, and then vanisheth away. For that ye ought to say, If the Lord will, we shall live and do this or that. But now ye rejoice in your boastings. All such rejoicing is evil. Therefore to him that knoweth to do good, and doeth it not, to him it is sin. Go to now, ye rich men, weep and howl for your miseries that shall come upon you. Your riches are corrupted, and your garments are moth-eaten. Your gold and silver is cankered, and the rust of them shall be a witness against you, and shall eat your flesh as it were fire. 